Eyes on Longmont, offering a diversity of topics about our community that will inform and entertain you. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Eyes on Longmont. Oh hi, I'm John Kiefer with OutsideImagery.com. Welcome to my home and studio here in Boulder. As you can see, my studio is much more outside than inside, and that's just how I like it. For the past 25 years, I've had a rewarding career in photography and writing, but I've shifted my focus from commercial photography to leading photo workshops and tours. Besides being outdoors more, I like the excitement digital photography and social media brings to people of all ages. Today, I keep my equipment simple and just about any technique that I show later can be used for any type of camera and any type of shooting situation. So please come in and let me show you some outside imagery. Okay, we're talking to uh, John Kiefer of Outside Imagery, and he is a professional photographer. He's written five books about photography. Um, he uh, is a person who does a lot of things outdoors, ranging from skiing to ph photography tours to mountain climbing, and uh, welcome, John. Well, thank you very much, Bruce. I really am glad to have the opportunity. Uh, one way I approach my photography differently is I really don't get too involved in the technical, the ISO, or the sensitivity and shutter speeds. And I really like to show photography that people can shoot with any camera, whether it's their smartphone or a big digital DSLR, as they're called. And you can use the same techniques. And it's more of a envisioning what you want to shoot rather than getting involved in all the technical aspects. Uh, the other thing I want to cover is that I do a lot of travel photography, so I like to be able to give out techniques that people can use in any conditions or just ordinary light. A lot of people talk about uh, you got to have the golden light, but and that's nice, but if you are traveling with people, fellow travelers, your spouse, then uh, you have to work fast sometimes. And I, I've learned to work fast. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, photography wasn't really my main emphasis in life. It was always just being outdoors. And I grew up in Iowa, and right during 1969, when things were a little crazy, we moved from Des Moines to Stanford, Connecticut, right outside of New York. And I kind of wanted to get away from things, so I had a little rucksack, and I was trying to sew pockets on it. And I think, I'm just going to go off into the woods and roam around like uh, John Muir. And the reason I included this uh, picture in the middle is that I was walking through a drugstore, and this is back then when uh, that's where they kept the magazines, and I saw a shot very similar to that. That photo I shot for the Colorado Mountain Club. And it was kind of mind-blowing. It's like, ah, oh, they already have backpacks, and they already have trails, and I learned about the Appalachian Trail. And that kind of really set me to uh, hiking the Appalachian Trail, parts of it, and going then to Colorado to go to college at Colorado State University. And from early on, I kind of got involved in doing black and white photography, and so all my friends would ask for pictures. And uh, there I am on the left 
in the Wallawa range, and my friend Frank is, oh, as usual, walking into a place you cannot imagine. And this is right on Trail Ridge Road. They call it Rock Cut, but it's for 40 years old, it's a, still a pretty neat photo. <laughs> when I graduated from graduate school at Washington State University, I was an entomologist. And I worked in entomology for a while. And I evolved into sales and marketing of scientific research equipment. And I did that for eight years. And it kind of uh, it reached the point where I had to change. And so I said, I want to be a nature photographer, kind of like John Fielder or David Munch. And uh, they had big view cameras, which held big pieces of film. And so I was talking to a person who was going to sell me my camera. And he said, you know, you should really be a photographer's assistant. And I said, well, what's that? And he said, well, you work with the best photographers and you get paid pretty good money. So I moved from Boulder to uh, New York for a while, took courses and worked for photographers. And then I moved back to Denver and assisted for two to three years and wrote these two books, which were really one of a kind. And I was fortunate enough to get them reviewed in uh, the Sunday New York Times. And that led to teaching and things. And I went through a period of doing a lot of commercial work. So these two books, uh, the one on the left is uh, during the film era and the one on the right is during the digital era. Um, what kind of work did you do as an assistant for these other photographers? Well, they had very unique responsibilities, much like a nurse or an apprentice. So uh, certainly one of the biggest was uh, doing all the lighting, making sure the cameras were loaded, running film to the lab, uh, working on the set. You know, back then you didn't have Photoshop, so if you had a mark on a label, I shot then and later a lot for Coors Brewery, you would have to literally have markers there and try to fix the label. Mm -hmm. And so you had a whole range of skills and from cleaning to talking to clients. Sometimes printing also? Or? A little. Mm -hmm. When I started there was some black and white printing and that just went out the door really fast because digital was slowly catching on. And during that time my really my big push was nature photography. So this is kind of the photo I strive for, a basic grand landscape. And back then stock photography was very lucrative and uh, it was before digital, and there was a lot of money to be made. So was this a, a large format film yeah. camera? What I would shoot is a piece of slide film that measured four by five inches mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. versus maybe one inch on a 35 millimeter camera. And nice light equipment, right? Uh, <laughs> I would say you, you carried 40 to 50 pounds to start, uh. and then if you wanted to wear any clothing <laughs> or have something to drink, you would add it on. It's, it was very tough. And, uh, and this is kind of how I started shooting. And then this photo here is just kind of uh, an example of how I evolved. The first shot was very simple, the grand landscape. And I, what I'm going to talk about here is how to incorporate more foreground to just make the image more complex. And ultimately, where we're going is way beyond that. So strap into your seats. Uh, like I said, I was able to travel all around the western U.S. My, my, my company then was called Kiefer Nature Stock. And I would travel in a camper with my family quite a bit to just about everywhere that was worth shooting. And here's a picture of my family. Uh, the four of us would fit in a small pop-up camper perched right on a standard Ford F-150. And that mm -hmm. Ford was one hell of a truck. I mean, it took us over a lot of places, never let us down, and somehow we all survived. But and, and at this period, you were building a stock photography business as well? Yes. Okay. I was represented by several great agencies, one right here in Denver called Stock Imagery. And then they all got bought up eventually by Getty and Corbis and were morphed into something else, usually out of business. And so uh, Grand Canyon is on the right and on the left is Glacier National Park and that gives you kind of a size of a view camera, pretty mm -hmm. hefty. And uh, just more, you know, I guess the one thing that I found fascinating about this is, or not even fascinating, is that just all the uh, inherent danger, which normally you don't think because 
you didn't have GPS, you had no type of smartphone, cell phone, and it'd be very easy to be down a road for four or five days and then come out to call your wife up and say you're alive. <laughs> and every time you went to a different, uh, like this is a very famous place in Oregon on the coast and you know, I had some hard trouble getting out of there because there was a big head wall and that's where the rock goes right to the water. And uh, I didn't really pay attention so I I had a lot of difficulty getting out after this shoot at about 10 at night. And in this particular shoot and others, yeah. you're, you're hiking by yourself. Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. You're always by yourself and you had no GPS and no smartphones or anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so usually in every environment you learn something. So the coastline, I learned a lot. It's uh, don't get too close to the edge <laughs> because the edges are very soft. Yeah, this is pretty. And. Uh, this is down in Slot Canyon. The shot on the left is uh, Antelope Canyon, which is now shot all the time, and people know right when this burst of light is going to come through. But when I walked through this section, it was pitch black. And a minute later, I turned around, and it was starting to glow. And, and with a view camera, you work very slow. And, mm -hmm. and so to get this shot was just a highlight. And when I showed it to my stock agent, Gary Adams, he, he just said, oh, well, you should have sh thrown some dust up in the air and made it really a nice shot because it would have created a beam. Uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. So, you know, you think you got the ultimate shot and it's like, <laughs> no. And Yosemite, just in here, this is a standard view of Yosemite. Earlier, I'd gotten a horrible case of uh, poison ivy shooting along the coast. And I must have been somewhat out of it by using Benadryl because I was all set up for the perfect rainbow. I'm not kidding. And I tripped my tripod and it just hit the ground and slowly <clears throat> over the edge. And oh. I was almost ready to go, oh, oh, chin, and it just went about 300 feet down. And uh, I w actually, I wasn't sure if they would insure me. So I went to Camp 4 and I hired a climber to rappel down and get my camera. And they did actually, I had insured and... Uh, but you are also a climber, so you... Yes, climb. but I wasn't carrying any climbing gear. Okay. And actually climbing in Yosemite Valley is the big leagues, by the way. There's a lot of hard climbs in Colorado, but they're not Yosemite. That's world class. Well, I kind of got into the digital age very early. This on the left, because I shot big pieces of film, you could make very large reproductions. Mm -hmm. And so this display was at the Colorado Convention Center, and I think the prints were about 60 feet wide. And so there I'm just posing. On the <laughs> right, though, very early on, we, my wife and I got into digital. And we didn't have digital cameras back then. What you did was you scanned film. Mm -hmm. and you had a digital file and then we ultimately put those digital files on CD-ROM and web for marketing and here I'm at a trade show in Los Angeles with our product which was very unique and very well re, re uh, well people liked it let's put it that way <laughs> um, well you're very it's early. very unique my wife and I we went to a trade show in New York City It was a photo trade show and up until then, you made most of your money by having your photos in a big print catalog, mm -hmm. a creative directory. And then those were sent out by the hundreds of thousands to ad agencies and creative people. And they okay. would literally order by the number. And there were done ten, you know, hundreds of dupes out there to satisfy them. But yep. everything was going digital, so we put people's film or scans onto a CD-ROM and DVD and then they could market those as a catalog. And they were very, very successful uh, to either individual photographers or smaller stock agencies. That, this is my third book called Mastering Nature Photography. And since most of my background was shooting, as far as stock, nature photography, and most people have an interest in nature, mm -hmm. uh, I put this book together and it, the CD-ROM that you see there is still completely functional if you have a CD or a DV, DVD drive. <clears throat> uh, it was written by my wife to run off a browser rather than any other Very nice. software so it still works. And, and this is kind of what, how I put the pages in the CD-ROM. Each one had kind of a caption and I made the photos small. Uh, 
there was such a big worry then about people stealing your photography and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I tried mm -hmm. to put words on things and, and just little captions. And images that were small enough that they wouldn't reproduce in print yeah. very well. Yeah. Just enough to, so you could see them. Yeah, and mm -hmm. uh, it was actually a very good book, and I tried to teach people the type of photography photo buyers want to buy as much as anything. And there was quite a bit in there on how to travel safely in the, you know, along the coast or in the mountains and the desert. And one of the biggest is I like to keep the light behind my outstretched arms or behind me. And that's if the sun is out. If it's cloudy, you can actually have the freedom to shoot in any direction you want. Mm -hmm. But when it is, you know, starting even in the morning, throughout the day, it really, you'll be more productive if you just kind of know how the sun is going to move through the sky. It obviously rises in the east and sets in the west. But as it moves around to keep the sun behind you, uh, when you shoot into the sun, it becomes what's called backlit. And here are two photos of maroon bells. The one on the left is really perfect conditions with the sun a little off to my side. And then the one on the right is late in the afternoon when it's backlit. Mm -hmm. The sun is over here shining. And you can see it has very little color and detail and very hazy. So you know, that's a very basic principle on just handling the sun. And this is a, an example of kind of what you don't want to shoot when it's bright sun like that and what you can shoot when it's cloudy. On the left I have a pattern of aspen trees and <clears throat> you know it's just a, a zoo of light and dark shadows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so shots like that along with maybe stream shots and patterns you can shoot under cloudy skies. And that's what the aspen trees on the right are. And the light is all even there yes. and very distinct kinds of separations. So. Yeah, and you do get a lot of color saturation. So if mm -hmm. you want to shoot close-ups of flowers, it's very good. Uh, close-ups of streams or streams, you know, with the flowing water. And other, you know, one thing on shots like this, you don't have to wait for a rainy day. You can wait until the sun is behind a cloud. You can get up early in the morning when that slope is in the shadow. Mm -hmm. All you really want is the entire scene that you're going to have in the picture to be in shadow to get an effect like that. And this is just how you might use the same concept if you're uh, traveling like a tourist in Europe. This is in the Alsace region in France. And a lot of the streets are very narrow and they're very similar to you might be in a canyon in Utah mm -hmm. where this wall might be very in shadow and this one is bright. And if you try to bring them both together, one usually is very dark and one is very bright. And the way you get around that is to, I try to just put most of the composition in shade or most of the composition in sunlight. And uh, then you don't have the bright contrast range. And the other thing, it makes uh, metering your camera much, much easier. You know, if you have patches of bright here, patches of shadow, you know, a lot of times your meter will read real bright or real dark and you end up with very different exposures. But if you can point your camera either mostly in sun or shade, you really don't have the metering problem. And here I am in Venice. My wife and I are traveling a lot to Europe. And on the left, you can see a very busy street with just a big uh, skyline of you know, way overexposed, but it works because I keep it down to about 10% of the photo. Mm -hmm. And then on the right, you know, it's just a cloudy day and you can shoot in any direction you want. Uh, the other thing about travel like this is, it, you know, a lot of people want to go see the main sites, which we do. But if you can walk off the main drag just a few blocks, you can almost be in solitude. Just wherever you go, Paris, mm -hmm. New uh -huh. York City. Uh -huh and here in Venice. And this is a shot, I'm just giving some basic instruction here to kind of appreciate the power of walking and how different camera angles can really affect your composition. Here I'm up on Davidson Mesa, which is just uh, near McCaslin Boulevard overlooking Boulder Valley. And all I did was I crouched down or I lowered the camera 18 inches. And you can see that it dramatically compresses the scene and changes the composition. Absolutely. And so just by moving the camera small amounts and being aware of how they react to the background, 
uh, you can really affect your composition. That's one thing that I'm going to cover. And here's my last little photo on just the intro. And it's called, I just have it listed as a shot list. And you can do yourself, if you're interested in advancing your photography, a uh, tremendous favor by just writing down a couple of things that you want to remember. And I remember this because for years I shot the Boulder Flatirons, which I know you know. And for the first 10 years, I probably walked by this lovely fence, mm -hmm. anxious mm -hmm. to get to where the shooting was. And once I figured, God, this fence makes a great, you know, composition, mm -hmm. you know, I wrote it down a few times, don't forget the fence. <laughs> and, you know, that's very important because there are certain techniques I'm going to show about framing that if you just write down a few words or remember, you can... Uh, get much better photography because what a lot of the techniques I show are not anything but remembering to shoot that type of photo. It doesn't require a big expensive camera or techniques and works as well with your smartphone. And oh, here is my fourth of five books. And this is where I kind of started my more advanced technique of getting away from shooting just nature. I shot nature and then a lot of commercial work primarily in the studio where you would shoot product mm -hmm. and things mm -hmm. like that. And so I was given the commission to shoot a book on Boulder, a very nice coffee table book. And I'd seen the past books they'd done, like in Boston and New York. And I thought, oh, they really do a great job. So I'm going to put a lot of work into this. And then they said, well, you only have 100 days. And you have to have all your things submitted by August. And I said, oh, man, that uh, tight. So I said, I'm going to shoot every day. But this page kind of, that is the cover of the book. And on the upper right, it shows that how you, and what I'm going to show is how you can just start integrating people into your photos. Very good. And those people integrating in the photos, I'm going to show very good techniques that these are, that's not strangers, these are people you might hike with, fellow, your spouse, your family, bike riders, and how you can take action photos, which for the most part, they're not aware and you produce great compositions and you don't really even ruin the setting or scene by saying, oh, I want to take your picture. You just take it. And part of that foundation is the stage technique and where I create a stage, a composition where people come and go. And I wait for people, buses, trains to come and go and take a tight composition as people move through. And some of this was born on a photo down at the bottom at the dairy I, uh, I really wasn't sure how to shoot this because the inside was not very nice. Uh, so I just created a great stage and I called the art director and said, I've got a great stage and your job is to put something right in it that looks good. Hmm. And it, it worked out pretty well. Is part of this an outgrowth of the studio work that you had done before? Yes. Okay. Yeah, because in the studio you never, you know, when you work with an athlete, and they don't know anything about photography, they kind of have this feeling that you're going to follow them around and take photos. Mm -hmm. Let's say they're a jogger, like I was doing a shot up on the hill of, for sunglasses, and I had a woman running towards me. A very fit athlete, and I just had to tell her that, you know, the only part of the shot that matters is this 20-foot piece of trail. I'm going to shoot you running towards me with this exact background. That's the stage. And when you get past this little rock here, you're going to stop and then do it again until we get the shot. Okay. And you have them go through that stage until you get the shot. In advertising, you don't want 20 mediocre shots. You want one great mm. shot. And then you go to another location. And I did continue to shoot some nature for the Boulder book because Boulder is very nature. and uh, Beautiful. This shot I almost missed because I had shot the Boulder Boulder the day before. And I was just very tired. And I wasn't going to go out. And then I said, well, just go out a little bit. Who knows? And right when I get on Foothills Parkway, I see a rainbow right <laughs> over CU. So I shoot that. And then I drive to Chautauqua, which was totally boring. And then um, here I was up mm. at Fairview High School. And it was just like exploding. And uh, fortunately, my and daughters went there. And I knew right that the parking lot has a great view. You don't see too many rainbows in the morning. And this really is, shows exactly where I'm heading. On the left, you have a standard shot of the poppies in front of the flat irons. It's a standard landscape. But on the left, since I wanted so many people, or on the right, I, 
I mean, uh, in the photos, Baudelaire residence, and I couldn't ask them all and set everything up. It gets to be very mm -hmm. time consuming, even though I did that. I started what I call the stage techniques. So I would just get a nice composition of the trail and wait for people to walk through. And it. when you do this, you can actually get every demographic you want. You can have an individual walking their dog, two senior citizens, and it's just a matter of patience. And the time is spent composing a nice composition with the trail meandering through the way I want. Mm -hmm and just a high probability situation of Saturday morning. So uh, you, you mentioned uh, waiting for maybe a senior citizen to, to, to walk by. You're thinking uh, different audiences, you're thinking different publications, you're diff and this is for stock photography? Yes. Okay. Much of this was originally for the book, but then you can repurpose it for stock. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it, it is uh, just a much more productive way to find a really great composition you keep the composition stable, right. and right. the people or boats, tour boats, indigenous people while you're traveling, they pass through the scene. That's very neat. And you can actually be in the background where they're completely unaware. Mm -hmm. And something like this could also be your hiking partners. You know, you could be doing a hike right. in the morning and you can just say, oh, just go on up, I'll catch up. Later, you know, you're fiddling with your camera. And so you just compose and wait for them. And then later you show them this shot and they go, wow, that's really <laughs> neat. And uh, there's just another shot in the Boulder book. And it's a very simple shot, but did what I wanted. It showed the flat irons. But uh, this is kind of where I'm evolving as far as trying to convey people to think a little more stepping back and including more in the foreground. Yeah. So this is a shot I really wouldn't have envisioned back then. I was really happy just to get a reflection. And now <clears throat> I really prefer shots like this and, and I call uh, something like a fence a personal icon, which I'll talk about later, where I learned to use certain subjects that I find a lot that I can work into compositions very quickly because I've used them. And one is fences and okay. another is benches hiking trails and things like that. So it's a way you can make more interesting photography if by just finding things that you like to shoot in conjunction with what you see, like there's a lot of bicycles around Boulder. So you can add those into your photos as you see. <clears throat> and so I did reach out to Boulderites and they just came flooding. Here's a barefoot water skier yeah. and uh, what I learned on this shot is when I first shot it, I was having problems with things being in focus because I would follow them and then all of a sudden my focusing would be on the background. Huh. And then I figured after fortunately just one day, I said, you know, the, the rope is always the same length, no matter where they're going. Right. So I'll just focus on him, put it on manual focus and then I solve that problem. But every time you go out and shoot even little jobs, you, you learn a lot. And then here again is the stage technique. And when I shot the Boulder book and Denver book, I really wanted to always show a sense of place. It's so easy to shoot, oh, here's a close-up of a biker, a runner. But I always wanted to shoot photography that people could say, oh, you know, I can be right there. I can mm -hmm. see that. Mm -hmm. You know, like here in El Dorado, I included the road and the trail so that people can think, you know, maybe we can just walk up the road and see it. I, it's not like some mysterious hiking trail that we have to find. It's all right there in front of us. And not just that, it gives perspective into how high that might yeah. be. Yeah. Because I know when I look at a lot of nature photos, you, you look at them, they're so magical, and then you realize that there's a lot of people around. There's a road behind you. And so here I kind of wanted to give more of a sense of place. And uh, the other thing I learned was, this is over at CU mm -hmm. and the uh, Shakespeare Festival, is that shooting digital, this is actually, I shot half these photos digital and half film. And I learned to really appreciate the digital because shooting a night shot was very hard with film because you had limited sensitivity of the film and you couldn't see results, so you'd have to record all your exposures. and. And then if the film was exposed dark, you might go to the lab and have them push it, it was mm -hmm. called, in order to make it brighter. So uh, digital really opened up so much because I could shoot people shots and not have the film cost, shoot night shots and explore that. And then basically they hired me to do a book on Denver, which I did, had a little more time. And so I kind of used a lot of the same techniques of 
you know, shooting night photography, also wanting to just kind of integrate nature into Denver because... Uh, and this again strongly shows some of your, your theory of having something interesting in the foreground to help frame the yeah. composition. So you've, you've, you picked this out, for example, I'm guessing, the photo on the left and, and waited for, for the, the duck or geese to mm -hmm. come into the, the photo that you had already picked. Yeah. In general, uh, one of the best ways to advance your photography is, let's say, and I'm going to show this very quickly, you know, you stop and you see a great mountain. Mm -hmm. And then you take a picture and that's kind of it and you look at it and there it is. But if you then just pull back and think, well, what can I really put in as foreground? Right, right. It's a great way to just kind of advance the photo. And so, you know, we, Boulder has El Dorado Canyon, but uh, Denver has Clear Creek and okay. it has Lookout Mountain and... Uh, the 16th Street Mall, so there was a lot of shooting. Here is um, just another way where I used the stage technique where I was at first trying to follow them, and then, but I really wanted the background the, to say this right. is Denver. So Definitely. it really evolves to say, look at, I'm going to stand right here. This is a great composition using lines, and you just do your thing in front of me. That's great, and there are skate parks everywhere. Yes. Uh, but that kind of ba background really says Denver. Mm -hmm. And it's very close to downtown Denver. And it's a very happening place, and people can just go there and watch. Mm -hmm. And just more night photography, uh, just because uh, it really was new to explore. But here you can kind of look at this the same way as here is your subject, a great mountain. And so I'm looking for foreground to put into it. Okay. Because most people, when they do fireworks, it's like, oh, there it is, and then it's black everywhere. <laughs> right, right. And so the real hard part is to get foreground underneath the fireworks. And as I'll show later, that can be a great concept for even clouds. Instead of fireworks, you have a great cloud display, and then you're looking for something interesting to put under that. Because things always look really good with great skies. Aha, here we go. Well, this is the foundation of my stage technique. And when you get out of your car, and I do it myself, particularly since you don't pay the price of looking at an expensive piece of film, you, mm -hmm. you tend to just blast away. And if you take that shot, it's a nice shot, but you know, then if you took your basic uh, photography course, the instructor would probably say, you know, why don't you get in a little closer mm -hmm. and kind of crop mm -hmm. here for the trees as a frame and and that's what you would uh, normally suggest you do. Right. And I kind of approach it just the opposite. Rather than getting in close, which you hear almost constantly, my thought through my brain is step back. And I like to include more. But in two, and it works out several ways because now with modern cameras, you get very wide angle lenses. And so you naturally tend to shoot more wide angle. But when you shoot more wide angle and get more into the scene, you have to take a little more care to control that open space. And I do that several ways. And, and one is uh, by putting something in the foreground. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a mm -hmm. horse sitting in front of the mountain range. It could be a flowers, it could be log. So rather than just having the basic mountain, think, oh, I'll put something in front. And then, but I'm thinking now, I want to step back further, so I'm including the fence. I really like this. Yeah. And then when I include the fence, because one thing I really, I really just have a few thoughts go through my mind when I'm working, besides the sun generally behind me, my, my outstretched arms for better lighting, I'm thinking lines. Lines are very powerful graphically, and you can shoot much more into the mid part of the day when you lose that golden light by having strong graphic elements. Mm -hmm. And lines are one of them, and one thing we have around here are fences. And so I'm constantly thinking of uh, stepping back and adding in the fence. Just so I don't forget, I guess the one thing that I really want people to think of is when you ever come to a scene, you're at the guardrail at the Grand Canyon. Everyone runs to the guardrail. Mm -hmm. You're mm -hmm. at a bridge, you run over the bridge, you take your picture. You're in your hotel room, you stick your head through the window and you take a picture. I suggest doing that because I do it. But then step back and include the fence include the frame of the window, include the guardrail to the Grand Canyon. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you'll develop a far better sense of place and it opens you up to do one more thing, include people and other interesting objects. 
So on this shot, I'm stepping back even further because, and I include a road. Now uh -huh. roads, yeah? No, I, 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 I like this a lot. When you include a road, several things, it allows things to go by, you know, so here's a car going by. But it could just as easily be your friends on a bikes or hikers on a trail. And roads are very, I shoot icons also. Icons are something in a picture that tell you a lot without you really having to work at conveying it. Mm -hmm. And a road conveys, you know, adventure, journey, even mystery, unknown. And so when you put icons in, they tell a lot of the story already. And then this shot here with the Jeep going by, uh, you know, a biker didn't go by. I would have preferred that. <laughs> but you know, even that as far as selling stock photography, it's like, you know, that's um, wealth, success. Here's a guy with his nice SUV driving by his horse farm. And so you can use a photo that way. And the lines are here are great. Yes. And if you think lines, you are way ahead. Now, one way you kind of build a stage is by framing. And uh, again, it's using foreground to kind of create a frame around a stage mm -hmm. where we're going to put in more advanced things. Now, in this picture, I just have grass in the foreground. And one reason I use a shot list is because I like to remember things so I don't have to think. Before I even got up to this lake shot, I knew it was going to be a tougher shoot because it was windy and there's no reflection. Now, again, picture walking to a lake and you walk to the edge of the lake. That's exactly like walking to the guardrail and peering over. Okay. Walking to the bridge, peering over. You walk to the edge of the lake and you look and if it's a great reflection, you got something. But if it's a cloud, windy day or cloudy, you have nothing but a sea of gray. Mm -hmm. So my thing is to step back and include foreground, which I'm doing here. And it's really no difference than including a guardrail. And once you kind of think this way, step back, the whole world changes. And here it is. I'm using the same technique in Paris. And instead of running right up to the edge of a a fountain, which would have kind of murky, boring water, I decided to pull back. And I'm using the exact same layout as I did with that lake shot to just frame it. And instead of having a rock in the foreground, I have this little basket of boats. And it really tells a story. Yeah. Now, when you shoot shots like this, you know, you don't have to, in any of these, you don't have to run around with your camera. Oh, uh, duh. you know, the camera is really just an extension of the eye. So when I shoot shots like this and there are people around, I just use my eye. I mean, hey. <laughs> and then when I'm ready to shoot, I bring the camera up because you're so less obtrusive. I have a phrase I use and I'll show it later called the unobtrusive photographer. Mm -hmm. So if people are walking by and they're your hiking partners, you don't make a big deal out of it. And you just take their picture as they pass by. Here I don't make a big deal out of it. I just wait till the scene comes together and then I take the camera up and shoot. This, ca this shot also shows something else very important. When you incorporate lines into a, a photograph, when they are diagonal, they add a lot of energy to the picture and draw you in. If they were horizontal along the base, that's more like a frame around a picture. Mm -hmm. So if you have pine trees on the left and right and some bushes in the front, you've literally created a very static frame, almost like you would if you put a frame around the picture to hang it up. If you change those lines on the bottom to be more diagonal leading into the picture, then it becomes much more of a part of the picture leading you in. And here is kind of that same idea. Uh, one thing that's different here is that I want to talk about is you know, a lot of times when People go out and they take shots of tourists or groups of people like here we were in, you know, at the base of the Eiffel Tower. Right here I'm at uh, a very fan famous overlook overlooking the Arno River in Florence, Italy. Mm -hmm. And this is another way that you can make shots work. Most, almost all the lighting that I show is very what I'd call ordinary lighting. Not like, oh, see, I got lucky. It would happen to be... A brilliant sunset. And this was four in the afternoon and it got to be 104 degrees. Just Ugh. a hazy, tough day. <laughs> but I use some very basic techniques on composition. I kind of frame off this side, stop it. And then I use the same with the Pont Vecchio, a famous bridge. But here's what I really want to point out is when you have shots of maybe p tourists or their indigenous people, you know, just set up the composition you want. And then just wait a minute 
because so many times you hear people say, oh, you know, that'd be a great shot, but, you know, that guy over there looks really weird walking that way. <laughs> in this shot, there are 30 people, and they all look perfect. And it only was because I decided to spend a few minutes with a predetermined composition right. and wait for them. I mean, these people are like lovebirds there, and <laughs> they're drinking water. I mean, every person looks just very natural, and it's, it's mostly a matter of just waiting and observing the scene. And here is the Duomo in downtown Florence. And the reason I show this is, you know, this is really nothing more than just a shot of a mountain with pine trees underneath. It's really no different right. than a mountaintop. Okay. That's how I look at so many photos because I started off shooting a landscape. I go, oh, that, that building is like a mountain. Now I want to put foreground in it. This church is like a mountain at sunset, but I want to put something in front of it. So I was able to just walk Nice. around and put these flowers in as foreground. So just having written down foreground will improve your compositions dramatically. And this particular picture, I, I'm guessing it's, it's not very bright. I mean, it's sunset or maybe past. Uh, so you set up on a tripod? On this shot, I did use a tripod. To get the depth of field that you wanted to mm -hmm. achieve, have the foreground in focus as well as the background. Yeah. But, you know, in general now, I really push a, an attitude of increasing the sensitivity of your camera and shooting shots like this even though you might think oh i do i wish i had a tripod or something okay but just there are several things and i'll go later how you can you know with uh, just knowing a few things on your camera like how to change the sensitivity or iso mm -hmm. and then people will say oh it gets kind of grainy or it might be noisy but, you know, you still get a fantastic shot mm -hmm. and a mm -hmm. shot you would never even conceive of shooting. So I uh, have become much more of a proponent of using my tripod a lot less and learning ways to uh, shoot under low light conditions. And one other benefit of that is if you were set up on a tripod here, you would have to rely on there being no wind <laughs> because those flowers would wiggle a little bit. And if you shoot with a faster shutter speed, with a, a higher ISO, you're more likely to freeze those. Flowers. Oh yeah, exactly, exactly right. In fact, you would be on a tripod, probably waiting for the wind to slow down. Mm -hmm. And this is just another way. You know, I was talking about framing how you put things in the foreground. Mm -hmm. But one of the best things you can write down on your note is overhead framing because it's something that you, I always forget in, and yet it's so powerful. It is, absolutely. And uh, it's a great way to, like the photo on the right, I was trying to minimize the gray sky and complement the shape of the Eiffel Tower. Yes. So that, you know, the, if you have a church or even trees, they can just leave so much gray space around them. And doing some type of overhead framing with awnings or branches really helps. Now the people running across the bottom, this is another example of the stage technique. I stood there and really composed the shot. Okay. And I was waiting for one of these red tour buses to come by. And I thought, oh, this would be great, a big splotch of red. And these girls were running in front of the bus to get ahead of it, so they made the shot much better. Absolutely. But on shots like this where you have tight lines, like a framing to kind of close off the right side of the street and really tight compositions, you need to basically hold the camera in that tight composition and then let the people or the bus go through it. And you might shoot four or five exposures mm -hmm. and then you pick the ones where they look best. Mm -hmm. And the photo on the left, again, the, the framing of the vegetation on top, the branches on top, kind of echoes the shape of the mountains as well. Yes. I mean, in Colorado, we're blessed that you can go into Rocky Mountain National Park and have a clear blue sky all day long. Mm -hmm. But after a while, you can get tired of it. The blue sky. Yes, uh -huh. it's like almost too much. Um, the thing about this type of overhead framing with the branch, though, and what I find empowering about it is that if you then notice, and you will, how you, little you move the camera to change those branches, you might move the camera an inch, and this part of the the pine moves several feet over. I mean, it's very profound. So then you got to, you really begin to realize how you can move the world by just walking or moving your camera a little bit and really change your compositions. And here is, just a, uh, I'm gonna go through a perfect a series of examples that I use all the time. 
Now the left, you have overhead framing. Mm -hmm. One of the best things to write down on a piece of paper so that you make more unique compositions because no one thinks about it. But what I have in the foreground is just an open space, which I call the stage. And what goes by the stage? Well, in this thing, there's always boats going by. So I just decide I'm going to just stand there and get kind of action shots of these boats going by in very tight compositions rather than trying to follow the boat. I think this is brilliant, what you do. And then the diagonal line adds a lot, believe me. It's amazing if a bike rider is riding by in a race mm -hmm. and I catch them going straight across, they look like they're propped up. Like they just have something propping them up. But if they go by at a diagonal, then they show all the speed and energy. Yeah. Now here's just another example. I was standing on a bridge here in Leiden and, you know, that would be a very nice composition, the top half of the mm -hmm. picture. Mm -hmm. In fact, even on the other ones, the compositions stand on themselves. But what I do is I just wait for, in this case, boats to go by and shoot and keep my composition tight and just shoot multiple exposures. And the same thing happens on the right. That's along the Seine River in Paris. The tour boats come through with regularity. Okay. And it's really just a matter of patience and this one worked out really nice because they're like the captain sitting on top and says France on the boat. It's like... Oh, it tells but, a story. Yeah. Now here's another perfect example and this is what I kind of say will be the unobtrusive photographer. Everyone goes to arches and, and this what kind of intrigues me about photography is that I hear this quite a bit. Oh, no one can shoot arches any differently now. No one can shoot maroon bells. Mm -hmm. They've all been shot. Well, I'm going to show you six shots of maroon bells that contradict all of that. But here again, I'm in Arches National Park, and everyone goes up to the arch and takes a shot. But what I want people to envision is a shot like this, but you just stand back and wait for your girlfriend or, you know, this could be your son-in-law and daughter hiking mm -hmm. up. And so rather than when you get up there and say, okay, let's stand around for a photo, then that's worth doing too. You show pictures like this later. And the key is to set up a tight composition, just let them walk through and shoot four, five, six shots. And every camera has a motor drive or an advance burst, it's called. And so much of that was talking about framing where you can use foreground mm -hmm. to comp make a much nicer shot. And then in that framed area, you can have people walk through it. And so you have very tight compositions. Now, what I also really play a lot in my brain is lines, because lines, any, so many things can be broken down into lines, and all of a sudden it's like, I'm not taking a picture of trees or flowers, I'm just really kind of working the lines mm -hmm. in the composition. And when you do that, you can go with some very basic things. And I divide my lines up into two ways. Uh, with diagonal lines that go into the picture, and straight lines that go to infinity. When I talk about other lines before, like a flat log going on the bottom or a, maybe a pine tree on the right, those are like static frames to contain. But when you have a straight line going into the picture or a diagonal line, those are lines that are going to be used to carry the viewer into the frame and also subjects. Much more dynamic. Yeah. And so when I was talking about how, oh, no one can shoot maroon bells differently, well, here's a very simple way. Now again, on each of these shots, the top half of the photo is a very lovely landscape and is probably shot by a lot of people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But no one shoots these shots. And it's really just because they're not thinking and they haven't written it down or they don't have an appreciation to how fun it is working with lines. And here they happen to be a road and a hiking trail, but they they add so much to the photo, like, you know, that really invites you in. Like, Absolutely. God, I, I can drive right there. It's fantastic. Or hike. I want to do a backpack into there. So how much time did you spend scouting out this kind of scenery? Or, or Very what, little. Did, well, were, here's... Did you climb for, for yes. the one on the left, or did you... Uh, well, with, the, it's taken it, when, from on the... Yes, actually, the one on the left, I... The parking lot is not more than a quarter mile up here. And mm -hmm. there's a big pull off and kind of a rock buttress. And I walked maybe 10 minutes on a steep slope, by no means dangerous, okay. to get to that shot. And, and I've shot it a variety of times. Mm -hmm. And then the one on the left is actually just at the very end of the lake, 
where the stream comes into the lake and it's just a hiking trail that runs along the stream so people walk along that all the time all right. now how you can carry this one step further is okay now i'm in europe or on vacation you know and i want to shoot faster or i'm just thinking lines and so here on the left i'm along the italian coast in a little village and I'm just using that line to send you right in through the picture, mm -hmm. uh, diagonal line. And then here on the right is the Matterhorn. And I'm just using the hiking trail just like before. So yes. the tendency would be to hike right to the center of the picture where there's a little overlook and take a, just a sterile picture of the Matterhorn rather than including the hiking trail. And so something even as that advances your photography quite a bit. Absolutely. But then you can carry it one step further in this, okay. like I showed with Arches National Park, how mm -hmm. you can shoot your friends as they walk up to the arch and boats as they go by. Here is just kind of the summation of all this. You have two types of trails. If you look at the background, it's exactly the same background, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maroon bells. Were, and then on the and right. recognizable. Everybody yeah. can tell. Yes. And it's kind of framed because you have high peaks framing the maroon bells and on the right on the left you know you can just really picture that with your let's say your wife or girlfriend you know and she walks by and says you know you just play with your camera i'm going to hike up to the lake well you have ulterior motives because you have the ability now to really just shoot a great shot so before she even gets there you can shoot one or two shots to say oh the composition's good right Right. And then as she goes by, you shoot three or four shots. And then you might, as you get more skilled, you can actually recompose on another part of the trail mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and use your telephoto lens. But the key is just to uh, shoot four or five shots. It's almost obvious when they have a really nice natural pose, and you choose those. And so then maybe, yeah. The, the photo on the right, then, is taken with a telephoto lens. You're no, actually, the photo oh. on the right, I, I'm on the exact same trail. I just moved and stood in the middle of the trail okay. and let my hiking buddies walk by. Okay. And they don't even know I'm taking a picture. In fact, most of the time it's like, oh, sorry, I'm getting in your way. Uh, right, right, right. And you just shoot. And a lot of time, even if you're not with hiking with somebody, uh, what amazes me about this is that usually something will happen. Somebody will walk into that stage mm -hmm. and something, <laughs> or, or a boat will come into that stage, although you've probably have in mind that something's going to happen, what might happen. I, I don't know. It just seems that uh, there's, there's some unknowns in here that are kind of neat, that are kind of exciting. Oh, actually, the unknowns are, because that's really what gets you a shot that goes one step further. Yeah. And I'll show you some of those later, where for some reason there's some chemistry between people that you just happen to get. Yeah. Um, when you are shooting shots like this, it's very important to be aware of body position. So if I was seeing that the guy in blue was going to move into the and kind of hide the person in yellow, mm -hmm. then I'll just move a little off to the left or right to kind of counteract that. And plus you're probably looking at the shadows and seeing how they're falling too. So, but you know, you can, sh again, this is the type of shot that you can shoot diversity. And I'm going to show some examples, but let's say if you have any interest in ever selling your work or just sending in uh, some imagery to blogs and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll give you some pointers there. Now here again, we're just in New York City. A few lines in this photo. Yeah, <laughs> right on the Brooklyn Bridge, which is a fantastic place to walk and take pictures. But again, the tendency is to just want to try to peer out through all these cables and take a skyline shot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, but here you can get a much cooler shot. I just stand right on the white line, which separates the lanes of traffic, and I look behind me. And so when I see something interesting coming by, like a biker with a bright yellow jersey, yes. then I blast away. Yes. And I was lucky enough that the tourists further in red were, you know, a nice separation. Yes. But again, just um, putting yourself kind of in the action and again, these could just as easily be the people you're hiking with or traveling with. Right. And then here is one of my favorite roads in all of uh, Boulder, Cherryvale Road, because it has great curves. And again, I just picture myself, if you were with biking with family or a biking club, you can just straddle your bike, pull out your smartphone, and as the peloton goes by, bang, 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 <laughs> bang. And, and really, I shoot this way all the time. It makes for wonderful little shots. And, Oh, that's nice. Here I am in the Dolomites in Italy and the same uh, technique. This was such a beautiful road. I took shots of motorcyclists and 
Well, what I remember about this shot is when we, just before we got to the Dolomites, I told my wife, I said, oh no, I think I made a mistake because we're gonna stay on the west side of the Dolomites. And right when I wake up, we're gonna drive right into the sunlight. Mm. And then when we get to the other side, in Cortina, we turn around, we're gonna drive into sunset. Mm -hmm. And so my whole thing of keeping the sun behind my outstretched arm was foiled. But it really makes a dramatic difference. It's much easier to drive with the sun behind you and look at all the scenery. Right. So just on a basic level, that works that way. Or let's say you, you get out of a, uh, a bus or a train and you get up onto the streets in a town. You know, I would just immediately say, where's the sun? Mm -hmm. well, I'll put the sun behind me and walk in that direction. And then here's just another shot of uh, in Chamonix, France, where I was shooting a lot of mountain bikers going by <laughs> and just kind of happened to get lucky. Yeah, that kid looking back. I know, it's great. funny. Yeah. But again, it's kind of strong lines leading from the corners. Mm -hmm. And when you think of diagonal lines, it, it interjects a lot of energy. Oh, here's just another way you can, uh, you know, if you have any interest in sending out your photography, but here, this is the exact same shot in the Grand Canyon. We were, my wife Beth and I were hiking up from Phantom Ranch on the Bright Angel Trail. And so we were having a break and on the left is, you know, a pack mule train and then lots of hikers coming down. It's really what you might think is a mob scene. And then really just moments later, that singular woman hiking, mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. like survival or <laughs> strength. Totally different story. Yes. Yeah. And just a matter of moments. So if you have any interest in approaching, sending your work out, the stage technique is a great way to just get diversity. Absolutely. And here's this kind of another example of how it works if you actually want to send out photos. You know, these are all skiers and if there was one snowboarder in there, I don't think a ski magazine would publish it. I've read ski magazines my whole life. Uh -huh. they, they just want skiers, period. <laughs> and snowboard magazines are the exact same way. Okay. Now, if you wanted to sell this photo or approach Colorado tourism, then they would want to see skiers and snowboarders together. To, All right. To, oh, and then you get more advanced and say, oh, I want to send my photos out to Shape magazine, which appeals to younger, healthier women. Then you might just want two women hiking one with a snowboard, one with skis. And if you spend a little time, you can create all those scenarios just mm. as they walk by. Wonderful. Well, this next series I have, because over time you'll construct beautiful shots and for some reason people must walk in front of you. <laughs> and it's like, you know, my thing now is just like trying to make a nice shot out of it. So I was shooting this road shot down near Telluride. Everything was perfect. I see these people stop they're going to take the same shot, I figure. But then all of a sudden they start walking right in front of me. And it's like, the view's the same. Right. And so I like it much more with them binoculars. And I, I do too. And there's a lot of times where I will be someplace shooting something and somebody will walk in front of me and I'm like, get out of my way, get out mm -hmm. of my way. But this makes it interesting. Yes, it really does. And they have binoculars. So even from a sales point, it's like, you know, is your future clear for financial, <laughs> you know, did you get the right broker? And then here again in Paris along the Seine, I mean, the Seine, Paris is just a magnificent city and they do so much neat stuff that just is artistic. Hmm. And here they just happen to have an art board so people could draw art. And I was just gonna take a shot of this artist drawing on the blackboard yeah. because uh, for Getty, it's one person non-identifiable. And then this child on the right comes in and I think, okay, he looks very French. And then this photographer literally gets, <laughs> kneels right in front of me. And so rather than going, you know, you, what are you, a rude Frenchman? <laughs> I just move over a little bit, but I really love those photos more. Yeah, absolutely. And this is again down along oh, the Arno nice. River in Florence. Yes. The shot I'll show next is what I kind of went down to shoot. But so I'm sitting there going, oh, I like this pillar and the lines, then they just get there and have dinner there. And it's like, man, that makes the shot. Absolutely. And uh, so I shot a variety. In fact, on one shot, he was by himself. This was with Getty sitting right out on the end of that stone. And that is where you can think of words like, you know, captain of the ship, you know, seeing into the future. Absolutely. And those are the type of words that designers use all the time. 
And if you're not thinking that way, you're kind of cutting yourself short. And then this is the shot I came to see. Mm -hmm. But that's the shot I really like. I do too. And then here again is the whole get back. I'm in the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. And again, there's the guardrail. And of course, everyone must go to the guardrail and take the <laughs> shot. But it, it, this is so much better to pull back from the guardrail, see the art students drawing right. and making a nice little frame. Because everyone shoots that and it really gets pretty, you know, monotonous. It's just another documentary picture. Right, right. It's been done. Yeah. Now here is it in action. This is my wife, Beth, who we see the same view, but she happens to <clears throat> get there first. And so rather than say, oh, turn around and, you know, smile, I just shoot her enjoying the scene. Mm -hmm. Now on the left inset, this uh, Leiden is where Rembrandt was born. And so she's standing next to a statue of Rembrandt. And again, I use basic framing to kind of restrict the yes, frame. Right. And then here, she's just looking and rather than maybe spoil the moment for her, I just shoot the shot. And then if I want just a reflection, I just shoot that later. Nice. But to kind of stand back and shoot vis uh, people like that is a very good way. This is just another example of you see a great mountain and you put some foreground under it. Here is, I interpret the clouds as a great mountain. Mm -hmm. Because when you see great cl clouds and you have a lot of them in Colorado, you know, that's a time to put something under them. So if you live in in a place and go, oh, there's a great barn down the street or a great this or that. Think, uh, next time we have a great cumulus cloud formation over there, I'm going to just run out and shoot it. And if you're smart, you would kind of even work out your composition beforehand. And just again, uh, part of what these are uh, talking about are shooting icons. And just about wherever you go, you can think of, you know, what really defines Paris. Well, one is the Eiffel Tower, and that's a delicate arch. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if you can just think icons, sometimes you think it's, oh, everybody shot those. But uh, it really does tell a lot. And How'd you get it with, with no people there? <laughs> probably just, a, I don't even know if I took anyone out. Because this was a very, you know, this was like four in the afternoon. I okay. don't know if people show up around four. But I know I shot Sunrise there, and I may have had to stay there all day. Okay. If there was someone there, they would be just the way I want them. <laughs> no, really, because I've actually shot the stage technique at, yeah. yes. and it works perfectly because you have there, and you just, obviously people are going to one by, walk yeah. by, and, right. and it's really, I have a lot of shots that way. Just icon, oh, this I wanted to show because you know, you have to kind of learn your equipment, and as far as the type of photography you shoot, you, in some ways, you evolve and even change your mind. I mean, several years ago, the photo on the left, you would not even shoot it because it's like, you would think, oh, it'd just be solid black, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I'll have this person framed. And it might look n neat, but the, there'd be so much darkness there. But even using simple photo editors that come in many, uh, with many, laptops and computers, not the big ones like Photoshop and Lightroom, you can do a lot to lighten up those areas. So you, you can get actually... a lot of detail out of those dark yeah. areas. And even out of the bright areas. Yeah, I, I probably know more than most as far as Photoshop and Lightroom, but even something like Preview, which comes on most Macs, they have little slider bars to lighten up the shadows and right. darken the highlights, and that can be an amazing power. Ah, now I'm going to show you a couple of ways to actually shoot more <laughs> diverse photography and personal photography, even in places that are overrun. Now this is obviously maroon bells on a perfect morning. And this shot that I have inset is as perfect as it gets unless you want right. clouds. That's, that's the iconic shot. Yes. And now everybody there shot it. And I was a little closer to the water, so mine might be a little better, but I'm not going to bank on it. But there's two things going on here. One is, how do you come away with unique imagery? And secondly, this shot that you see here where I'm shooting the whole crowd, not one of these people with a big, heavy DSLR shot that, I bet. Mm -hmm. But all the people walking by who are not photographers but have their smartphones did shoot it. You know, so all the tourists who just got up and 
you know, might be gone in five minutes. They're actually shooting a much more interesting shot to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all these people who are tied to their tripods are just trying to shoot the same shot that all these hundreds are. Yeah. So one w way I like to teach, I lead a lot of private photo tours, is I say, learn to shoot your DSLR like a smartphone. Because a lot of times they'll take their DSLR and they pack it up right in their backpack in the front seat. And you drive, but the person with the smartphone is like this, oh, hanging out the window, taking pictures <laughs> through the window, and really having much more fun. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. even if you have a big, heavy DSLR, just learn to hold on to the strap. But, you know, learn mm -hmm. to take those spontaneous shots that may not be technically perfect of just you going down the road. Um, what really kind of got me started in that is that I would, a lot of times I have to get there early for sunrise. And so the first thing I say is, why don't you get your camera ready just in case there are a moose walks across the road, you can take a picture. Mm -hmm. But what really turns out is about a third of the time they go, oh, I don't have my memory card. <laughs> <laughs> or where's my battery? So, it's a, it's so they would have missed the sunrise shot. Yeah. So you mentioned photo tours just now. Can you say a little bit more of that? It's, it's all Colorado photo tours or yes. Boulder City tours or Denver? Well, or? generally I have, I have taught photography and everything from rock climbing and photography over the years, all the way back to when I was assisting. But mm -hmm. what I do now is I offer private photo tours and it's kind of a unique niche and they range anywhere from Rocky Mountain National Park, mm -hmm. where I do have permits to guide people there, to downtown Denver. So I advertise through the internet and a lot of uh, flyers in mm -hmm. hotels. And for $400 to $450 a day, I will take one to three people in my car, and I pick them up wherever they are, yes. oftentimes hotels in Denver, Estes Park, and I design a photo tour or a tour around what they really want to see. You know, yeah. some people are very interested in photography and want to get for sunrise at Dream Lake. Right. And other right. people want to be just kind of taken around and see the sights. And so I kind of judge what they want. And uh, so it can range all the way from going up Mount Evans for wildlife to Rocky Mountain National Park to Denver. I mean, I really love picking people up in Denver and doing uh, hiking all from like Civic Center Park down to the train station right, and right. Confluence. And you get a whole range of how to shoot uh, street photography like you might do if you traveled in Europe. And right. So that's the type of photography I might teach on that type of uh, trip. And, and that kind of thing, for example, in Denver, you, you talk about the buildings also, the history mm -hmm. and some of that. So it's a, a tourism kind of photography at the same time? Yes. Yeah. And actually, I am teamed up with a guy who does Denver history tours. I'm on mm -hmm. his website. And since I have done books on Denver and Boulder and then the nature book, I pretty much covered all of Colorado. And I, I worked in Denver for 11 years to boot. And you know we still go down there. Actually, my wife and I go down there every couple of months just to walk up and down uh -huh. and then go to Confluence Park. The reason I showed this shot here is you have a thousand people there and somehow you want to get a different shot. Now, I have the best shot there. I mean, it's as good as anyone's. It's like perfect. But so does everybody else. So I think, how can I do things different? Right. Well, the one thing that I do is we talked about icons that tell a story right away. And so I, what I have is a, what I have are personal icons. And those things I come across all the time. And since I've worked with them, I learn how to fit them into compositions. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And one thing that I always keep in my mind are fences and benches. And here's a series of shots where I incorporate benches into them because it really invites people into the shot like, oh man, I can just imagine sitting there right. and enjoying lunch. I also incorporated strong lines and leading into diagonal, infinity. And diagonal, yes. But what I like about this shot is that I, most of the time I think, for the thousand people who walk by here, I'm probably the only one who shot it. <laughs> and then I do the same thing in Denver, just kind of using some basic things because I knew when I arrived at this shot, it was just going to be a very boring Mondo morning. So just through technique, I overhead framing, that helps a right. lot. Uh -huh. And then just the bench and then a little framing on the right with the tree. Great. So even though it's a simple, I call it maximizing kind of a bad situation, kind mm -hmm. of mediocre. And then here's just another bench I can use the exact same mm -hmm. technique in the Dolomites. Now, that's not really a fancy village, 
but it really makes you want to just sit there and uh, have a glass of wine and some crackers. Or what I like even more is people being able to think, God, you know, I can go right there. It's not like I have to hunt down. Right. right. You know, it's obviously a park and it's on the road. And there's a bench there because yeah. there's a great view. Yeah. <laughs> and then I can just carry the same technique to the Matterhorn. And I will shoot this with people sitting on the bench if I will, you know, if they're appropriate. And then here again, I was down shooting night in along the Italian coast and you know it might be eight or ten at night I don't really feel like thinking that hard but I think benches and lines and since I've used them a lot I can just incorporate them. Uh, yep. Now here's another shot of maroon bells that most people never shoot and I learned this a long time ago in advertising there was a shot of maroon bells with a car in front and the key was all the telescope was pointed at the car and not the view. <laughs> But that made an impact on me that, you know, I'm just going to pull back and shoot those. And I was going to ask you, did you move the telescope, the, <laughs> oh, the viewer course. to, yes, exactly. You definitely have to. And then here it's in front of a dark shadow. So it really, Because yeah. it becomes a subject. Yep. And then here I am in Paris, nice. a totally overcast day, which if you stuck your head through the guardrail and took pictures, like everyone, you'd have kind of um, gray skies and gray mm -hmm. architecture. So here again, the, just keeping in mind, step back, really brings you back and you really get a sense of what it's like to stand at the Eiffel Tower, whereas you would have none of that sense if you were peeking through the gate. And I think the telescope is really interesting. Oh, yeah. It's very interesting. And, it does, and even the framing up here is like overhead framing. Uh -huh. It's kind of... Yes, it is. Uh -huh. Acting like branches. Is that a pretty wide-angle lens there? Mm -hmm. Probably just wide-angle and what's on my camera. Okay. I mean, 18 to 135, maybe. Okay. Because I, I try to carry a few lenses. And then I can do the same thing in <laughs> the Dolomites. <laughs> but here again, what you tend to do is everyone wants to run to the end of that pier. Mm -hmm. And I will do it myself. But, but what you want to kind of just keep in the, your mind is step back and shoot the end of the pier where everyone wants to stand. Because that kind of gives a sense of when people look at that, they go, oh, man, I want to be there and I want to be right at the end of that pier looking out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I want to be on that bench. Not in, so you don't take the picture in front of the bench. And then here I, I really like to give things a uh, sense of place. And when I travel, I notice on my first trip, I really didn't have a shot of where I was staying or what I was eating. And I had one or two and it's like, oh, I really like those. So again, step back. These are both just hotel rooms, and I could have stuck my head out the window and did. But I also like to step back and frame it. Again, the basic technique of framing. And so that you can really think, yeah, that was my room. I was standing there. And then in, yeah. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, and the photo on the right here with, with the tea and the cup and the chair is kind of like the bench. Oh, looking at that, I say, you know, I would really enjoy sitting there with a little bit of mm -hmm. tea and looking out the window at that scene there. Yeah, exactly. In fact, you these I just put there because you can be somewhat of an artist, you know. Mm -hmm. I can put the chair where I, I can't necessarily move the benches so easy. <laughs> but there I just decide because we all like, we like coffee in the morning, uh, you know, to put them there and put the chair that way. Yeah. Just And that really comes really right back to shooting in the studio where, you know, when you walk into a studio, it's a big room, yes. you know, and if you want a background, you build it. Uh -huh. If you want a table to put something on, you it's find a it. It's a canvas. Yeah, it's something you construct, so you're uh -huh. used to putting things. So that just gives me a much better feel for where I stayed. Uh -huh. And uh, what I really remember about this, though, is we got into town late, and I had a great idea of, uh, oh, we'll just go find a hotel, and that wasn't so easy. So a man was uh, loading up his car with his family, and I said, is there a hotel around? And, and uh, he said, oh, just follow me. And he took us right into town, stopped, got out of the car and said, here is a, our two good hotels. And, you know, so meet up with the locals. They're very nice, yeah. very nice. Oh, here's just another one shooting through your hotel room. I call that hotel view. And then I have car view because I travel a lot. And um, I just like the whole sense that I shot this right out of my car. Right, right. And not, so this is just some graffiti in France. The French, the French graffiti is very artistic. You step <laughs> over into Italy and it's like slash marks everywhere. <laughs> so there I purposely frame things just like in the hotel room to give a sense of place. 
And here's a railroad car view. <laughs> Outside a railroad I love car. this photo. I love yeah, this photo. I do too. But then again, you know, uh, try to include the part of the hotel room, try to include part of the train to really get a sense of where you're going. And then food is, uh, this is for a couple of things. Food's very important in Europe and probably just about wherever you travel. I mean, it's going to be unique. Mm -hmm. And so it's really fun uh, taking pictures of it. And one way I like to shoot is what are generally called kind of grab shots. But, and again, it's, it's being quick and not annoying people, but you don't always have to look and try to get it perfect. And if things are out of focus, like a hand, mm -hmm. The idea is just get a sense of uh, where you were visiting. And so a lot of times when we're having food and just at a stand, I'll just take a quick shot right from my hip. Wait, ch -ch, or I walk by people. This shot right here, I kind of lined up the shot as far as uh, my crop. And then I just walked by. He was a bookseller along the Seine River in Paris. They're very historic because during the 18 late 1800s, 1900s, they were, that is where people got their mm. news. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the old photos of uh, like Jean at Jay and some of the, uh, Bresson was another one, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. see that they have these book stands a lot in the background because all the contemporary news was sold out of those. And so, so this is really street shooting also. Yeah. yeah, and one way to street shoot is, um, you know, just be off to the side you know, compose the focal length what, that you think you're going to need, crop it, and then, you know, if you press down halfway on your camera, you'll usually lock in your exposure. Mm -hmm. And then you can just walk by, and as you walk by, you just go bang, bang, bang. <laughs> now, sometimes I do it this way. I go bang, then I lift the camera up, bang, bang, just to... Get a little angle to make sure you hit... Yes. And it's a fun way to shoot. Uh, this is Venice, and, and uh, there's a travel writer named Rick mm. Steves, and he has given me some pretty good advice, and he advised this hotel in Venice. And the reason I put this in is because it, it had a great view, but when I order, a, a, get a room, even through Hotels.com, I try to contact and ask for a room with a view wherever I go and because a lot of times I was just in Europe and uh, that's a said, great view and the, and the size of that of that cruise ship relative to everything else it's just gigantic <laughs> isn't it though yeah. particularly when you see some of these small boats yeah and they have a lot of boats that's on the Grand Canal and they just hover around these like flies I mean <laughs> because they come in in the morning at about nine o'clock and leave in the afternoon But here's another example how you can just take a very gray day and try to use some components to fix it. Mm -hmm. And so I used overhead framing right. just to cover a gray sky. I used the fence as the long fence. lines. Yeah. The kids were playing around. So what really got me to pull the trigger on this one was in this woman right there who was buying tickets. I said, oh, you look perfect in there. I'm just going to shoot it. There's a little archway. Yeah. And the red umbrella. So yeah, well, yeah. That's... So you kind of get what you can out of a photo using some of your basic techniques. And then when I got inside, I used kind of the... What was really fascinating and what I find so much about teaching photography is when I was showing the black and white prints and even the view camera, it was also frustrating. Because on black and white, it was t chemistry and things had right. to be at temperatures. Mm -hmm. And then the view camera, you had to load up each sheet of film alone, and it was very arduous. Nowadays, people who are young like that, all the way up to retired, they're just having a lot of fun taking yes. pictures. And yes. that is the difference. And that's really why I love uh, teaching it, because it's so free. Mm. You're, and I just love the joy of this. And then he reviews the photo with his mom, and it's, it's like... It's great. Wow. I mean, that's how I felt when I saw my first photo. <laughs> I probably had a lot of pictures that never came out beforehand. But And then here's just the uh, last few shots on some basic stage technique. Uh, here again, you just look for nice compositions where you think people will come and go. And the one on the left is Central Station in Amsterdam. Great lighting on that, too. Yeah. And I just stood there and I was able to get a composition where you could read 
Central Station or mm -hmm. Amsterdam Station. And uh, when we were talking about chemistry, on this shot, the one thing that's lacking with those two people, there's nothing connecting. It's like I'm looking out there and I'm thinking, I want them to hold hands or show that they're nothing, mad at each other. Nothing or connecting the yeah. two people. Yeah. Uh -huh. There needs to be some chemistry gotcha. between those to make give that a five, now it's a four. And then here again is just, um, you know, I mean, you see a shot like that and you just can't imagine, you can imagine that people are going to walk through that and make a neat shot. So you just sit there and have lunch for a little bit. And you're just counting on it. I mean, yeah. it's, it's wonderful the, how serendipitous it is and uh, how interesting it ends up being. Mm -hmm. What I even found interesting about this is that in the background, there's like two guys kind of wrestling around like holding the guy over the head like this, you know. <laughs> I don't even notice that until later. And then here again in Chamonix, Ooh. these paragliders take off in the exact same place. Okay, and so, so you know yeah. what action is going to yeah. be. Okay. And so I waited for this cable car to go by and I wanted to have Mont Blanc and Chamonix below. So rather than following, of course, I just let them pass through the scene and Wonderful. take multiple exposures. <clears throat> Here again, we love skiing, so we're skiing Europe now here. Just, I took shots of this church, and then I saw some people walking by. Yes. And so I just, they're coming up from a parking lot, so I said, well, let's just wait and see how they look. So I shot a few there and a few up here, and same technique here. I uh, just park myself in the middle of the slope. Nice texture on the And I see too. people uh, come by. Yes. And shoot them as I just point downhill, bang, 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 bang. <laughs> What's amazing in Europe is they just groom very specific trails and that's all you stay on. This trail goes all the way down here to there and then oh. down. And only the skilled backcountry skiers with beacons and guides go in all this other area. And then here again, my daughters, I just pointed the camera down here and I said, just make a turn around me. And once I could kind of see him in frame, I just went bang, 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 bang. <laughs> Great. Yeah, now I'm just about done. Um, the reason I put this in is this is a shot of my wife and I in the Dolomites. Mm -hmm. And I always get the responsibility of asking someone to, you know, will you please take my picture? And so what I do beforehand is I do at least a little thinking to think of what composition I want. Mm -hmm. And I kind of get the camera set up, so I literally just have to hand it to them, and I tell them to take a few shots. And hopefully I, I pick someone who seems like they'll be competent. <laughs> <laughs> but other, the other thing about this is that, and I go to tourist areas, and a lot of people ask me to take their shot pictures, and uh, I really like to. And I like to take a nice, I don't get involved in trying to make it artsy and all that, but... I really do like to take uh, shots of other people and then when they look at them, they go, oh, wow, you know, because so many people are trying to take their own shots or one right, right. versus the other. And so you do meet a lot of nice people doing that. Not that we keep in touch, but. Oh, and this is just kind of being more aware. Again, this is Mesa Arch where everybody mm -hmm. in the world shoots, mm -hmm. just like Maroon Bells. How can you get anything creative at Mesa Arch? And everyone shoots it the same way. Well. On this shot, um, everyone had left. In fact, I got there at midnight and slept in my car. And about three in the morning, I wake up and there were cars all around me. And already it was um, thickly crowded at this mm -hmm. little spot. Anyway, there was one guy left and I told him that uh, they used to do ads up here and people would run across the arch. And so when he okay. got up there, he right. started jumping and, and then I just kind of photoshopped him in <laughs> jumping off the cliff. but. You are good at Photoshop. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> I, I really shoot a very real type of photography, but I clean it up. This was actually the field trip that the Flatirons Photo Club had uh -huh. up on Trevor Ridge Road. All right, all right. And every for the lunar eclipse, mm -hmm. and everyone was shooting towards the moon. And every time I did it, I, I it was like, why is my exposure so off? <laughs> and so I said, oh, forget it. I'm just going <laughs> to shoot these people. And so I, uh, you can shoot stars very easily if you keep your exposure at about 20 seconds. Okay. Uh, get as much sensitivity or ISO as you can, which is like 6400. And then you shoot with a very wide open aperture. And then you don't get the movement of the stars. So I just shot 20 exposures in a row of these people all looking towards the moon. 
and they're all very still uh, and nice silhouettes. Invariably, the one moved here and there, but over about I just shot one after the other. Yes. And uh, this is a shot completely untouched up on Loveland Pass. We hiked up there because I um, actually had seen very interesting shots shot during full moons. Yes. Because there's so much light. In fact, they looked almost too normal. And so we, I just said, you know, I'm going to try something crazy. And I threw a light headlamp in the tent, and it was during a full moon, and just a few candles in front of us. And after three or four takes, the clouds came in, and the shot was over. But The just, lighting is wonderful on this. I know. It's just awesome. So the idea there is just to experiment. Mm -hmm. I think that's it. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you very much. I, I, I learned a lot. Um, I've heard you speak before. I have tried out some of the technique of the stage stuff mm -hmm. and, and have surprised myself by what, what can happen within a photo. It's oh, good. A, it's a very neat very Actually, neat I have given that advice to some people, and they went right out and shot some cover shots for the Colorado Mountain Club. And I just said, find a diagonal trail. Mm -hmm. They were in Roxborough, and then just send, you know, because they've heard me talk too. You yes. know, just walk naturally, and there they were. But, uh, yeah, I think that one thing that is so great about photography is uh, just the ability to explore uh, for free, for one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then if you do want to uh, get more advanced, certainly there's so much software out there that uh, takes it to almost any limit you want. So it's and really had a rebirth, I would say. Wonderful. Well, thank you again. And, uh, more information about you and what you do is outsideimagery.com, yes? Yes, okay. outsideimagery.com covers uh, just about everything I have, which is mostly private photo tours, but also my books and my stock photography. Mm. Well, so, thank you very much. You're very welcome. I had a good time. Mm. Thanks for the opportunity to show you some of my photography. I hope you learned some useful techniques, maybe even a different way to take photos. Please visit outsideimagery.com to learn more about my photo tours and workshops or to just send me an email. I'd like to hear from you. Thanks. Bye.